Here's an idea. Dungeons and Dragons can make you a confident and successful person. D&D is a tabletop role-playing game. Now, there are a lot of different tabletop role-playing games like Shadowrun, Call of Cthulhu, Vampire, Pathfinder, but D&D is the originator, popularizer, largest, and the most well-known. First published in 1974 by the late Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax, both of whom deserve a moment of silence. Dungeons & Dragons is a game built on collaborative storytelling. There is a group of adventurers and they are charged with some sort of grand task. This is a role-playing game. It takes place entirely in our collective imagination. You know, like, save the important person, find the relic, defeat the badness. <laughs> One person, the dungeon master or game master, plays not as an adventurer, but as the rest of the world. They play the non-player characters, the bad guys, the weather, a blade of grass, I you name it. They are the one master. in control. The adventurers describe the actions that they would like to take to the DM, who then lets them know how it goes. There are a lot of rules and mechanics which make a D&D game go, but at the heart of it are these two things. Improvisation, and dice rolling. In a D&D game, you aren't restricted like you are in a video game to a limited set of actions. When a problem or obstacle presents itself, you can try anything, like anything, anything, like go nuts. Because a person and not a computer is on the receiving end of your crazy ideas, the possibilities are basically infinite. The DM will probably make you roll a dice, the result of which will be modified by your character's natural abilities, and then this determines how well you do in the game. So for example, let's say a human mage, a dwarven warrior, and an elvish thief are in the forest when an owl bear emerges. The mage casts a four spell on the owl bear, which has a low willpower, so it's not backwards. The dwarf dashes around to execute a bus stop. He rolls athletics, a skill he lacks, and rolls a 19. Success! As the owl bear falls, the elf does a leaping backflip to pickpocket, which because of his eye acrobatics and dexterity, he achieves and gets the circlet of forking paths. This circlet gives you plus one to hit when facing a gazebo, which we all know is useless because it's a gazebo, but hey, everyone loves good loot. Anyway, if you don't know much about Dungeons and Dragons firsthand, you probably know it by reputation. Up there with model trains, late 19th century Russian literature, and Magic the Gathering, tabletop gaming sits high on many nerdiest thing ever lists. These games tend to conjure a very specific kind of person. But assumptions about gamers aren't based on reality, they are rather the effect of a spiteful glamour spell which was effective because of your low perception skill. I'm attacking the darkness! Nah, JK, it's because of common assumptions based on stereotypes supported by popular media, so that's not your fault, unless you write for Big Bang Theory. In which case it is your fault. Knock it off. <laughs> The fact of the matter is that there are many famous outgoing people whose names appear on marquees all over the world that are Dungeoneers. There are some that you would expect, like Patton Oswalt, Rain Wilson, Chris Hardwick, Alexis Urhanian, and Will Wheaton. But there are a bunch of others, like Vin Diesel, Kurt Schilling, Michelle Malkin, James Franco, Sasha Gray, and two-time NBA MVP Tim Duncan. Furthermore, not to insert myself into awesome company, but I play tabletop RPGs and have for a while, and so have my friends. And we're pretty unfamiliar with the classic tabletop nerd stereotype. I mean, I was the president of the theater society in high school. I might not be helping my case much. Anyway, it stands to reason that real D&D players don't actually fit their cultural stereotype. In fact, they have a chance to be more sociable, more outgoing, maybe even more successful than non-D&D players. Hear me out. German philosopher Martin Heidegger described the way in which the world is lit up through our interactions with it. And these interactions augment what he called the at-handness of entities within the world. To Heidegger, this is how worldhood is constructed within our consciousness. Basically, our view of the world is constructed upon our constant and varied interaction with things. The more things we interact with, the more we're able to react to new situations and go with the flow. The D&D universe is interaction on hyperdrive. It provides infinite possibilities, and it expects its players to constantly innovate within the game universe to accomplish goals, solve problems, defeat beholders. It gives you an infinite amount more flow to go Excuse with. me, flow? <laughs> the effects of the choices you made and skills that you learned during the campaign hopefully stick with you, enlightening new possibilities when you're normal you and not halfling rogue you. As a player, you deal with larger-than-life problems and the ever-shifting politics of collaboration. And as a DM, you learn how to manage an entire group of people and their environment. While you might be naturally shy or soft-spoken, if you have to play as a dragonborn battle mage, you'll figure out pretty quick how to take control of the situation. Why? Because if you don't, then the campaign game is doomed over, and there's man. no game, game to play. Over. And if you, actual you again, are a little disorganized, but your pals are coming over for a game that you're DMing, you're gonna make sure that all the character sheets and tiles are in order so that everybody knows I who they are Jack and Josh. what they're doing. And also, Cheetos. Where are the Cheetos. Always Cheetos. I don't know what it is with D&D and Cheetos. Now, aside from having to perform a character in front of a group of people, players are expected to do their part in crafting an interesting and engaging story while it's happening. How can I help you, dear madam? Oh. Please, no need for such deference. I'm no better than a gnome. And you're not even really in control. I mean, dice rolling gives you a lot of experience with the randomness of the universe and how to deal with it or work around it. Rolled a natural one on your athletics check, climbing that mountain wall and broke your leg? No problem. Good thing you have a high intelligence and marksmanship. Make yourself a rope elephant.
elevator out of that grappling hook and branch. Heave ho! But you're right, most people aren't super genius marksmen in real life. How is any of this actually useful? Unlike basically every other game, tabletop games require a lot of improvisation, and as it turns out, that makes them a lot like real life. And that's not all. Social dynamics, public speaking, creative problem solving, organization, mace swinging, these are all very useful real life skills. D&D provides a system for understanding people's actions and motivations by giving them classifications of sane, insane, good, evil, and all combinations thereof which is infinitely useful in the workplace. I have people skills. And while you might not be building a rope elevator in real life anytime soon, the fact that you had to describe in detail <laughs> its design and operation to your DM is great practice visualizing and putting your ideas into words. Which if you ever want to build something impressive with a group of people, which describes most fun careers, might turn out to be pretty useful. Of course, not every tabletop gamer is going to be a charming, savvy bon vivant with great problem solving skills. And clearly not every successful anything is a former D&D nerd. But it seems a pretty easy case to make that D&D and other tabletop games nurture a set of skills which are not only useful, but maybe necessary for making it big. What do you guys think? Can tabletop games contribute to success? And if you are a gamer, have they contributed to yours? Let us know in the comments. And Dungeons & Dragons joke about subscribing. Please subscribe. I detect feels. Let's see what you guys had to say about Doctor Who and religion. So there were a lot, a lot of comments that fell into one of two groups. The first being that Doctor Who can't be a religion because it doesn't involve any faith. And the second being that Doctor Who is more of a philosophy than a faith. So we're gonna respond to both of those two groups in turn right now. GoldLucky13 and a lot of other people said that Doctor Who can't be a religion because people don't actually believe that Doctor Who is real and that his adventures never actually happened. To that I say, there are a lot of people who are, I think, very devout who probably don't believe that their religious texts or mythos is real, is literally true, but more of an inspiration on how to live and how to treat other people. And so I think the fact that Doctor Who definitely doesn't exist doesn't necessarily take him out of the running for being a religious figure of some kind. Lux and Nocte and a bunch of other people pointed out that Doctor Who was more of a philosophy than a religion, uh, which I think is a really interesting distinction to make. For me, a philosophy is more about removing mythos uh, instead of trying to access the world and ideas and ethics through mythos. And the existence of a very strong mythology in Doctor Who, I think, kind of makes it hard to call it a philosophy, but maybe I'm being really academic. The 1H Duck makes a really interesting point about Doctor Who being, if it is a religion, being a very early religion because of the separateness of its values and ideas, uh, which I think also gets to the heart of one of the things that we were really interested in in making the episode, which is uh, not if Doctor Who is a religion, but if Doctor Who could be a religion. Abo Final points out that Doctor Who's mythos is just as magical as the mythos for pretty much every other religion out there, which is a pretty good case, I think. To Lol J, who wants to know whether or not I would travel with the Doctor, the answer is of course I would. Uh, the three things I would bring, I would bring um, a guitar. Uh, I would definitely bring my phone because if there's one thing I've learned uh, watching Doctor Who is that having a phone is incredibly useful. And then I would probably bring, um, I don't know, my dog, maybe? But he's really dumb and would probably run away or get eaten by a dinosaur, so I don't, I'll have to get back to you on the third thing. I gotta think about it. Tabrawler posted a really great comment about the cosmology developed by Doctor Who being a kind of incomplete or bad one because the Doctor changes his worldview with every regeneration, which is really interesting and sort of asks this question of whether or not our saviors or gods need to be perfect characters. Christianity might say yes, other religions might say no. It's a really interesting distinction. To Alan Black, number one, genetics. Sorry. Number two, just shave with scissors. 